It has taught me so much about myself in the process. Coming together in this retreat and these women sharing their stories. At the end of all of this, I looked at all of them and I said, you know what? Based on everything that has been shared here, business is easy. It's the other things that we've gone through in life and the challenges that we have faced that's the hard stuff. Business is easy. And I've asked all of them to kind of remember that you've done really, really hard things. Yeah. So this should be gravy. Sales gravy. Hey, Warners, welcome to another episode of The Women Your Mother Warns You About, sponsored by Sales Gravy. I'm Gina Tremarco here with my sassy co-host from the UK, Susanna Gray-Jones. Hey, Susanna. Hello. (laughs) Hello. You can talk up a little bit louder. (laughs) I do not talk like that, Gina, (laughs) but I will talk a little bit louder. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here and a pleasure to have this guest today. Really excited. I know, I know. Before we um, introduce our guest, um, I do want to put out, I know we've had a lot of guests lately and we haven't had a lot of just you and me time. So I wanted to put out there the little chuckle that I had this morning with you, which by the way, I put all over Facebook and I don't know if you saw it, but I, I did a screenshot of your WhatsApp message to me this morning where you said, what's a bachelorette party? And I, I put it out there, you're you, to explaining stag and hen and all the parties. And this is yet another one of those lost in translation, Susanna asking me what a bachelorette party was. And that just tickled me this morning. Well, I'm invited to one. I'm very excited. Um, yes, it'll be your first American bachelorette party. Which is what the UK um, citizens called hen party. And if you go into the northwest of England, people will often call any female is an endearing um, phrase. Oh, all right, hen, you're all right, you're all right, hen. Um, because obviously a hen um, was not always known as the female chicken, it was actually known as any species of animal. Um, in the middle ages. So there we are. Historical (laughs) fact for you. Another historical fact. Is it better to be called a hen than a cow? (laughs) Well, I I like to think that I've never been called a cow. I think I would prefer to be called a hen, but um, yeah, I I don't know. I mean, cows are beautiful creatures if you you meet the right ones and they're not angry, (laughs) but (laughs) you don't want a mad cow diplomatic answer there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, that voice that you heard is Beth in Corvati, who has joined us today as a guest. And I know Susanna was like, how do you know each other? Well, it's uh, it was one of those random, sh- <laughs> if it's okay, that Beth, I, t- I tell the story. Beth, I, Beth downloaded something at Sales Gravy. And I think mm-hmm. it happened to be one of my downloads, perhaps my book of play. So, you know, in saleswoman fashion, I reached out and said, Hey, thanks for downloading um, my book of play. But I also had scoped her out. So I went to stalk her and in my stalking, um, what, what I came across on her website that got my attention and I'm like, Oh, let's just have a conversation. I want to know you. And you know what? Just listen. Why don't you just come on the podcast of um, the CEO sister circle is what caught my attention. And that's why Mm. Beth is here. Beth, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's really my pleasure. So now, Susanna, now you kind of have an idea of how I found Beth. I I don't really know Beth all that much. And I thought this would be the place to get to know her. I want to get to know you too, Beth, Um, especially after reading some of those comments on LinkedIn. You've you've clearly changed a lot of people's lives. Um, Tell us about you. Well, I guess the short story is that um, I've always been entrepreneurial. I started making money at eight years old. I've also always been um, a little bit bossy pants. <laughs> I prefer to say I prefer to say a, a strong leader. And I kind of found my way after college into roles that um, allowed me to to lead others and supervise. And then I eventually sold a business, found my way into the real estate industry. And after a couple of years of successful sales, you know, being a top producer in my market, I just really found that what I was more interested in is the business aspect of the real estate industry and helping others um, do what they want to do, build their businesses and 
Yeah. So that's, you know, it's been 22 years in this particular industry, having worked in title, real estate, and mortgage. And now I get to help people expand in a massive way. So that's where I am today. Expanding their businesses and also their lives, which is what one of the comments said on uh, LinkedIn. Um, so uh, t- tell us a, a bit more. I mean, you said the bossy pants thing, and um, I immediately looked at, at <laughs> Gina. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, bossy pants. Pants in, in the UK is underwear. So bossy underwear. Is that what you're thinking, Susanna? That's not. No, we've been there. We've done that one. Um, <laughs> but but do you, what I'm interested in, because I'm fascinated by leadership and management, and it seems to be something that you, you spend a lot of your time working with people on. Um, and there's always that question that comes up, isn't there? Um, are you a born leader? Can people be born leaders or can they be taught? Um, what do you think? Taught to be a leader or are you naturally born a leader? Well, I have to tell you, in my case, I think it this was a byproduct of the circumstances that I had growing up as a kid. The bottom line is that I was really scrappy because I had to be. I was very resourceful because I had to be. And I think what I was blessed with was just simply the ability to understand that I was going to get what I, I was more likely to get what I wanted if I kind of took charge and created things for myself. And then what I also figured out is like, wow, when I do this, people kind of follow me and this is, <laughs> and this is kind of good, but it really truly was a, um, a bit of a survival tactic for me as a kid. I'm just being honest. The other thing that came into play for me really early, which I credit all the time when I talk about kind of my story and my trajectory, is that I credit all the time, I say this all the time, I credit the public library, Girl Scouting, and Junior Achievement with helping me become who I have become as a professional. Left largely to my own devices as a child, and I was a very voracious reader, I would walk myself to the library every day in the summertime and spend hours sitting in the stacks. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I read nonfiction more than I read fiction because I was just really curious about the world. So, but let me get back to your direct question, you know, kind of born to it or taught. I think that anybody who is committed to learning skills can learn to be a fantastic leader. But what I have also found is that It's easy for me to kind of recognize that innate ability that they may have. And I get excited when I see that little spark in there to help develop that, that we can kind of expedite the whole thing and go faster. Yeah, really interesting. I like what you said about that little spark that you can sometimes see and then, you know, exercising that out of interest. If you were in a room full Mm -hmm. of like 20 people and you had a problem to solve and you didn't know any of those people, would Beth come into the room and automatically take charge? I would come into the room and automatically start observing people first. Um, I, I like to kind of stand back and assess and I'm going to look for body language. I'm going to look for posturing. I'm going to look for authority. And if I really needed to get something done, I would more likely gravitate towards this person who in some way, shape or form is uh, presenting with either authority or a knowing that's, that's typically my MO. Well, that's the EQ 101, which goes hand in hand with leadership because that is about uh, social awareness, right? Really being able to size up a room before walking in like a bull in a China shop, which we see a lot of leaders by title do that. Oh yeah. I did that. My first managerial job. Yeah. Um, You just, you walk in um, with some kind of bravado to prove yourself, which is really just a cover up for insecurity. mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. And does it ever work? Not very often. (laughs) You know what? It might get attention in the beginning, right? It might get attention in the beginning with people who um, don't know what a good leader is. So (laughs) But I think a good leader is going to do exactly that. And I think for for most of us, at least for me, when it came up, when I came up in leadership, um, I was definitely a, I'm still a bull in a China shop, just in a different way. (laughs) But I was definitely, you know, a bull in a China shop coming in because I didn't want anyone to know that I didn't, you know, that I was insecure with, with my leadership abilities. 
You just made me think about something, Gina. I had made this like declaration to myself a couple years ago when I left a company that I was working for and started my own practice and business. And what I had written down that morning when I was journaling is that I will finally be the leader that I always hope I would have. Mm. You know, because of over the course of my career and even as a girl, those people that were in positions of leadership, I don't know, I was always like, I'm waiting for you to step up. This this can't be all that leadership is. Mm. What I hope, I love that we have conversations about emotional intelligence and um, leading with love or compassion, empathy, all of those things, because I've, I've got to tell you that a lot of the leadership that I was exposed to, particularly as a younger woman, you know, in my 20s and 30s, the women in positions of leadership, frankly, were disappointing. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. And, um, sometimes I don't even want, I don't want to say it cause I don't want it to look like I'm not supporting the sisters, but uh, I, I definitely saw a lot of that. And I gravitated to male leaders more than female leaders because there was less insecurity from the male leaders. And they're quite frank, frankly, I was encouraged more by my male leaders than the female leaders. You yeah. think that's what it is? Insecurity? Oh Yeah. Yeah, I I think it's definitely an insecurity because when you might perceive yourself or tell yourself this story that you are um, maybe a a minority, so to speak, right? Like you are um, a small percentage of a larger group. And I don't want to use the word minority even to, I don't want to create (laughs) some kind of effect from that. But when you are a smaller percentage of that mass population, Um, And you might feel insecure about that and you're judged by that. So again, you have that kind of bravado to you um, that I don't, again, I don't want to go gender on this, but I do feel like I've definitely had way more support, encouragement, mentorship from men. And I know women are going to debate me on this and they've had a different experience. That's just my experience. That's just my experience. So Gina, you've used the phrase bull in a China shop a few times in this conversation. And the truth is, is that I've been referred to in the same context in the same way. And interestingly enough, I've always found over the course of my career that most successful men, whether they were in leadership or not, had zero problem with my personality or my leadership style or anything else. It was the women you know, I never had a man tell me to tone it down, but I've had lots of women tell me to tone it down, right? And I was yeah. always like, what is up with that? But I've also thought a lot about how just even the concept of leadership, like what is leadership? I don't think it's something that's it should be introduced to children as part of their education, because whether or not you are responsible for a group of people, there's going to come a point in time where you have to lead yourself. Amen. Yeah. Right. And there are concept. There's, you know, there is, there is an art to this. There is a science to this. And I just feel that when you are encouraged to embrace some of the aspects of leadership and use it on your own life, then you're far better able to make decisions around what is in your own best interest rather than relying upon others to tell you. Mm. Yeah. And again, it goes hand in hand with emotional intelligence, right? When you look at emotional intelligence and the, um, the two components of self-awareness and social awareness, right? When you look, when you break that down, it starts with being aware of your own stuff. And back when I was doing, when I started out in leadership training, right, part of that focus was I have to be aware of my own style, my own emotions, my own skills. And, And once I get a handle on that, then I can then I get better at social awareness and managing and directing because I have to understand myself first. This is an exercise I used to teach. Um, I used to teach an exercise in self-empathy, how to actually empathize with yourself and, and know what your emotional triggers are. And when you do that kind of work on yourself to understand yourself, only then I believe, can you be the most effective? Yeah. Boom. That's, that's my, that's my thing on leadership. The thing that I see and I struggled with, um, because I was a remote manager, this is before the pandemic, um, when I was managing multiple offices, 
And I kind of figured it out with my team in London. But then I was managing Liverpool. I was managing Manchester. I was managing Birmingham. And naturally, it, as we do in sales, people start communicating too much, often by email. And I speak to managers today who really struggle with that challenge of remote management. Um, and Beth, because you're speaking to people and coaching people every day in management, um, what's the best bit of advice that you can give to anyone who's listening to this and managing remotely? Ooh, um, I would say that you, you still have to create an environment where it feels that you are physically present. And I think I would also make take advantage of the opportunity to go deeper with your own people. Again, this is emotional intelligence. I, I frankly, I love Zoom. I love being in rooms with my people, but I love Zoom as opposed to a phone conversation because I can watch for expressions and the way people are responding to what's being said in the room. And I've just what I'm working with with my clients when, within the CEO sister circle is pay attention to that. Are people engaged or are they checking out? Um, and you know what? You use the word management, and management is a word that makes me cringe. It really does. Um, I think it's easy for people, it, the term gets used, you know, meaning the same thing, but I think it's extremely different in terms of how it shows up in the business aspect of things. But so I left the company I was working with before and started the CEO sister circle for myself in the pandemic, because frankly, I was seeing the response that a lot of companies and organizations were, were having to COVID. And it seemed to me that they were creating a lot of fear and scarcity among people. And I didn't like that. And I had this moment where I was like, you know what? I have identified my ideal client. They are a successful, high achieving woman who is juggling a lot of things. They want to grow. They want to scale. They want to leverage, but they're not going to be able to do that unless they can learn to lead themselves first, their business, and then others. So within my practice and the time that I spend with them, I know that their life is going to show up in their work. And so I need to understand their life. And I tend to reverse engineer everything because I believe that our work, what we do, we work to fund our perfect lives. Mm -hmm. So I want to know what their perfect life looks like. And if that perfect life means, you know, I take four vacations a year or whatever, then it becomes, okay, well, what does that look like? How do we lead your business, leverage the opportunities in order for you to do that? So every single one of my clients is different. They care about different things. They're motivated by different things. Their values are different. But collectively, it is this idea that they want to continue to grow both personally and professionally and they're willing to take these risks within a time frame, you know, the time that we're living in right now, where we're just not really sure how it's all going to shake out. Plus, the whole concept of the real estate industry is being, it, this is news every single day, right? So these are very interesting waters to navigate. Tell us a little bit more about the CEO sister circle and how you got that started. And is it specifically aimed towards women in real estate? Um Within the real estate industry, I have, though, in my own practice, coached people from different businesses. I just saw a need for this within the real estate industry. I know a lot of really amazing people who happen to coach within the real estate industry, both real estate salespeople, mortgage, et cetera. It's heavily male dominated. Yeah. And what I wanted for myself was really to just create more of an inclusive community. Mm -hmm. So my women are smart, articulate, highly learning based. They like being in rooms with each other. So we, so there can be a, an exchange of ideas and strategies. They're from all over the U.S. So there's market comparisons. There's referral opportunities for all of them. We had a fabulous retreat in December where it was just about letting our guard down. We didn't come to, and it's called Come Together is our annual Ooh, retreat. I like that. And in 2021, the theme for the CEO Sister Circle was certainty. In uncertain times, 
let us approach our businesses with certainty. But then 2021 is kind of rolling around to an end here. And we were all so desperate to get into this room together for our come together Mm -hmm. to like physically be able to see and touch each other. And so our theme for this year is connection. And it is, um, it has taught me so much about myself in the process coming together in this retreat and these women sharing their stories. I, at the end of all of this, I looked at all of them and I said, you know what? Based on everything that has been shared here, business is easy. It's the other things that we've gone through in life and the challenges that we have faced. That's the hard stuff. Business is easy. And I've, I've asked all of them to kind of remember, right? That you've done really, really hard things. Yeah. So this should be gravy. Sales gravy. (laughs) (laughs) Now, well, well, you know, I am. I, I coach and train a lot of people in real estate. So it's, it's a niche that I have fallen into at sales gravy. I work with home builders. I work with um, agents. I work with mortgage. I, I obviously don't work within the industry specifically, but it's become a little bit of my ballywick. And I just went through purchasing new construction and I went through that process and there have been, and I talk about this a lot and I share this with some of my clients in that industry of what my experience was going from home builder to home builder, which is a little bit different um, mm-hmm. because they're, they're sitting in a design center. Oftentimes people are coming to them and things are a little bit different right now, obviously with inventory and lack of, and one of the biggest things I've noticed is the PTSD that they appear to have. Because, and I would love to hear your perspective on this because I'm talking about it as someone who works within the industry, but not in the industry. And, and so the feedback I've been giving, I actually called a prospect that I've been working for a while now to say, hey, just want to let you know, give you some feedback on my experience. Actually, I purchased a home through your company and um I just want to give you some feedback on that and the industry in general. I'm walking in and these people, these sales reps are just, they're so beaten up that they can't even crack a smile when you walk in for the first impression. So I know that's a big open question, but I would, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what's going on. This is 2022 that we're having this conversation in case anybody listens to this years later. Okay. So my first thought is you're describing these salespeople beaten up, beaten down, right? Can't crack a smile. All right. That's leadership's fault. Ooh, there we go. Okay. That's leadership's fault. Anytime you bring someone into your fold and into your organization, you have a responsibility to them. Mm-hmm. You're going to get out of them what you pour into them. Ooh. Ooh. I mean, that that's the truth. So More has been required of leaders in the last two years than probably ever before. More emotional intelligence from leaders Mm -hmm. has been required, okay? But you are just choosing not to pay attention if you're not seeing what's going on with your salespeople. As you were saying that, I, I wrote down a couple of things that the women within my CEO circle, and by the way, I do coach a handful of men and they're awesome, amazing, successful men. And uh, all three of them are great leaders, which is awesome. But, you know, they they have a lot of intelligence around what it takes to help your people be their best. OK, so I will tell you that my concern for uh, the people that I've been coaching is, are you taking care of yourself mm-hmm. because you are taking on so much responsibility for your employees or team members or salespeople? It can be hard to continue to inspire and motivate and let people know that everything is going to be okay if you have these seeds of doubt that are bubbling up in your own head. Yeah. Right. So we work an awful lot on mindset. Everything, what's that expression? The fish stinks from the head down or something. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah. And um, what I also think is enormously required of us now more than ever before. Of course, the real estate industry, you know, the market changes a lot. 
But I believe that we need to, as leaders, we need to be highly adaptable and specifically solution oriented because if we are demanding the same thing from our sales staff, for example, expecting them to create or deliver miracles, I'm sorry, you can't get all your buyers into houses if there's no inventory. So what do we do to create that, right? So I think the adaptability and the -the out-of-the-box creative thinking and where do other opportunities lie? Because P.S., anybody who's listening to this, thousands of homes are bought and sold every week that never make it to the public market, right? Yeah, my fiance's home sold before it hit the MLS. Yeah. Because we bought new construction, then we turned around to get it listed and it was, it never hit. It mm-hmm. was gone. One, one buyer looked at it, offered 10,000 above asking and it poof, nobody even knew about it. But how are we training our people to develop that skill set when they've always relied on something different? Right. So I think that we talk an awful lot about this and I'm always getting them in check. So for example, with your people, I'm like, you've got to keep your people's head in the game, but more than anything else, your people need to know that you love them. The challenge I, I see people having with that, um, is that especially in sales, right? I know we're talking specifically about real estate, but, um, you know, within generic sales where you, you get that salesperson who, and you, we call them the terrorists, right? Um, the people who come in, they probably don't want to be in sales. They don't work well with people. They go off on their own tangents. They often upset people. Um, so we all know those types. Um, and occasionally they can bring people with them. So you see, you, you, you hear about sort of two or three people at a team. So say, for example, Gina was walking into an office or somewhere and she didn't get any smiles. And you had those group of three terrorists, if you like, <laughs> Are you saying that you think that would be an issue with leadership if those three salespeople were maybe in the wrong job and one of them was leading the other two? Yeah, if they if they hired them, if they absolutely. So I I tell my clients that every every person they bring into their business is a reflection of their own standards. Yep. And so that leader is responsible for making sure that. The standards are consistently met. Gina, have you ever been to a Chick-fil-A? Oh, God, yeah. yeah. Right? My okay. pleasure. My pleasure. Exactly. They yeah. don't say you're welcome. They say my pleasure. My pleasure. They've got the standard, they stick to it. And they're not open on Sundays. And they're not open on Sundays. It's the culture that they live by. Yep. That people, people will actually, I've known people who've gone and taken jobs at Chick-fil-A, grown adults, because they wanted to go through the customer service training program that that Chick-fil-A provides to every employee. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They are impeccable on customer service. Impeccable. So, So when people say it's hard to get people, you know, to get good customer service, somehow Chick-fil-A manages to instill it in their employees, train them to it, and they deliver. You will never, ever I've never met a surly, unhappy employee at Chick-fil-A ever. I go go to McDonald's and I'm lucky if they even look at me or say hello. Seriously. Yeah. It's just so deeply embedded in their culture. Yeah. Which is another thing that I think that's really important that my clients continue to reinforce with their own people. You know, if you've got a culture that supports achievement and but also supports balance and happiness and joyfulness, um, then we also see uh, greater retention, Yeah, right? People stick around, they feel understood. And frankly, I think they want to do more for their own leaders. Well, I, yeah, I think at the base of it, at the core of it, we all want to please. We all want to make a contribution. And if our bosses aren't happy with us, especially for emotional people like me, if, if, if we do something that, you know, we want to please. And so when we sense disappointment, right, that's not good. But when we sense that, you know, we've done something well that they're happy with, it only inspires us to do it again. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm facilitating a treat, a retreat for one of my clients next month in a really cool place um, in Texas. And he does this every year. 
And it's just really to bring this like group of, you know, eight, 10, 12 of us all together more for the cultural experience and just being together and kind of shaking off the business for a couple of days and focusing on the teamwork aspect so that whatever's been kind of beating them down, they get a break from, Mm. right? So the idea that we walk into a new home sales center and we see somebody who can't crack a smile and looks like they're ready to burst into tears you know, the best thing I think a leader could do in that case is round everybody up and saying, we're closing on this day and we're all coming and we're all going doing this together. Show some appreciation, you know, make people feel like they matter and that you know how hard it is for them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it, yeah. Going, going back to the real estate piece of this, right. And the leadership behind it, right. Again, every time I've walked in, they are they are on the defensive. Now, this is, you know, something that Jeb Jeb has written a new book called Selling the Price Increase. Uh, we we are now teaching, you know, courses w- with that book. And similarly, you know, when we have to deliver, here's the price increase, right? If we are not able to communicate that, especially in a B2B situation ahead of time, we are often going to deal with customers who are on the defensive. Otherwise, we want to at least present the increase or ask for the increase from a real estate perspective in B2C. Uh, there's there's no real opportunity to present an increase because it's continuing going up. And I, I had an agent, I actually reached out to a friend who's an agent and said, can you walk me through what's going on in new construction? You're a real estate agent. You're out doing this every day. I'm like, give me an overview. And she was amazing because she literally painted the picture of how each a um, home builder was doing things and gave me an education on it. Well, that's not really happening from the home builder front, right? So the customer coming in is getting incredibly confused because this builder does it this way, this builder does it this way, this builder does it this way. And what's happening is the reps are getting beat up because it's like, well, over here, this builder says, Right. And so everyone has kind of a different thing that they're selling based on their, you know, who they are and what their model is. But if, if leadership could get involved in some way, and and this was the advice I gave to a builder, I said, teach them or let me teach them, teach them how to pull the, the story out of the buyer, right? Pull the story out of the buyer, diffuse the situation, be curious be inquisitive instead of going into this place of, oh my God, another customer is going to ask me and I got to tell them we have nothing to sell. Instead, just get that out of your head and think about the customer, not yourself that you're going to beat up. When you show that you're curious about them, their walls are going to come down. They're going to start telling you their story, right? This is where I started to get deflated because I'm excited to buy a house and I'm walking in and I'm like a puppy and I'm like, oh, I can't wait because I'm building a new studio for sales, gravy, house. right? I'm so excited. And my, my, we have got nothing available right now. We've got supply chain issues. We've got nothing. I'm like, I'm very aware of that. And I'm cool with that. So can we talk about your next phase, right? Like I, I'm not the normal home buyer in this case because I have a little too much information. Uh, but I had to like really break them down to p- get them to pull my story out. Like, could you imagine if instead of being in this defensive mode, you just switched it into curiosity mode? And take, and how about not focusing so much on a transaction or not being able right. to immediately close the transaction and instead? think about the bigger thing at play. And we see this in the residential resale market as well. Yep. When teams are built or new agents come into the business, they're just thinking about sell that house. And instead it's like, no, you kind of think about incubation, filling your pipeline, nurturing people, building a significant sphere of influence, all of these things. Stop focusing on this. A lot of people see the way that I construct a buyer consultation and it freaks them out a little bit. I can't believe you want to ask these people all these questions. And I'm like, I want to get to know these people. I want to connect Mm. with these people. I want to create loyalty with these people. And to use your term, Gina, I want their story. Mm -hmm. You get people to share their story with you. And if they come to feel that you are very, very clear on who they are and what they want and the why around it. Yeah. 
you're less likely to have them go wander off and to buy a house on a whim with another agent. Exactly. Exactly. And that's it. Exactly. Or another builder, Mm -hmm. right? If you would have, if you would have spent some time, because now if you think about the process I went through as a buyer, originally when we walked in our thought process, our original goal was let's look for something that we can buy Um, new construction that will be ready early 2023. Like we were kind of putting it off for a variety of reasons and we were focused on 2023. Not once did someone say, why not now? Because we do have these that are under construction that are going to deliver in May, June, July, August. Why not now? Let me, what's, what's going on that you're waiting until next year, right? If somebody would have done that, which nobody did, right? We came to our own conclusion. Let's do it now Mm. on our own after going to five or six developers. Now, if you think about it, every home builder we visited all had inventory available in the next couple of months, but our heads weren't there. We ultimately got there and ended up buying from someone, but maybe we would have bought from someone else. If, if they would have taken that time to help educate us, to get our story, right? Uh, if they would have done all of those things and they could have developed some kind of loyalty and they could have developed some good word of mouth and they could have developed a relationship for down the line. And like you said, a sphere of influence, but they didn't do any of that. So here's, here's a thought. So what if those people working in these models... Imagine how it could be a different experience if the sales manager said, okay, this this is the thought process that I want you to adopt every time you are in this model home. Every person who walks in the door is either secret shopping you, a buyer today or in the future, or is a referral for you. How would you show up knowing that you were being either secret shopped? Yep. Or you were going to have a definite buyer in your pipeline or a referral. Yeah. I don't, that is not a hard thing to instill in your people and require it. And in fact, it's the same type of thing that I tell when I work with people and we're talking about hosting open houses, right? I'm like, okay, rule number one, you got to go in saying, I'm going to meet my next client today. Everyone is secret shopping me. Everyone is a potential buyer or a seller. Mm-hmm. Everybody could be a referral source or everybody is somebody that I can earn, put into my database and nurture. And at Mm. some point, right. We'll do something for you. Right. You're making my mind go crazy. with The parallels to recruitment here, um, because that's my background and it's exactly the same, isn't it? You know, when you speak to someone for the first time about a particular job, why would you ever do that? You know, first of all, find out exactly the script, exactly what they're looking for. Um, and true of all sales. And it just emphasizes the importance of that deep, deep discovery, never assuming and filling the dots in, always looking for what, what could actually be the reason. I love that story that you gave Gina, um, about no one actually asked you why. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I, I've thought about just this podcast doing this has made me thought about that, that it just came to be that no one has ever asked me somehow we got convinced and persuaded to do it now. And I think that was because of the real estate agent that we were working with, who ironically is a longtime friend of mine who used to work for me um, when I owned my improv comedy theater. And she also worked for my husband um, in his ex-husband, ex-husband. I've got a new husband coming up. (laughs) (laughs) She worked for my ex-husband in his sunroom company but I had reached out to her for help because I just didn't know who I could trust at this point to get information from. And I said, did you just paint the picture? And she went above and beyond, not because she was my friend because, and the way she handled herself, she was like, "What well, do you want to come to my office and we can keep this very professional and I can walk you through everything. And I'm like, heck no, I want a glass of wine. Let's go to happy hour, bring your stuff with you. And we did that. And she walked me through. She she did her homework, so to speak. She pulled out, not necessarily, I mean, she pulled out comps, but what she pulled out was, here's a list of properties in all of these different developments. 
And here's what they're going for per square footage. In this development, this is the per square footage. In this development, this is what, here's what's going on in this development and it's the most popular. Now let me break it down for you on how each home builder is working and then broke it down for me that way. And when I started to see the picture and I was like, okay, because we were, we were in this um, kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for that's slipping my mind. We didn't want to believe, we were in denial that the prices were what the prices were, right? Once she showed us the landscape, I'm like, we can't touch anything for under a certain price. And we didn't want to go to that price, not because we couldn't do it. We just, I'm a little bit older and I'm thinking about retirement. I'm thinking about the mortgage 10 years from now. I'm not thinking about the mortgage today. Again, if you would have got that story out of me, that could have been a different thing. But but once we accepted the reality of like, these are the prices and they're not going down. Now, could we have another crash like we did? What was it? 15 years ago. Could we have another crash like that real estate wise? I guess we could. Yeah. I mean, anything is possible, but I don't think the prices are going to go down. I don't think, I think right now the interest rates are, and of course, Beth, you could speak to this better, but when we put it all together, we're like, when we started looking for homes six months ago, they were 50,000 less. And then when I talked to another home builder, who's a client of mine, she did a, she pulled a report that prices went up $87,000 in the past year. Like, you know, once I got the education, I'm like, we got to go now. Let's do this now. But, but someone took the time to give us the education. Mm. So of course, when it was time to sell a house, right? Then the fiance and I were like, he's like, well, I want to use this person. I'm like, no, (laughs) we're using her because of all the work she did, law of reciprocity, right? And then she got it sold before it got listed. And that's how this works, right? This is what we should be. This is the mindset you should be in as a salesperson, don't you think? Yeah. And for those who are responsible for a team of salespeople or those who lead companies, what are our standards of practice? Yeah. Establish it, require it. And I I really do believe that we do tend to attract who we are rather than what we want. Mm. And so again, those who approach their businesses with, you know, high standards, a mindset of abundance, being learning-based, curious, great people skills, Well, you kind of exude and model that and you're going to attract more of the same. Amen. I agree. Yeah. All right, Suzanne, I'm going to stop talking. (laughs) I'm just enjoying sitting back. It's a lovely, unusual episode. (laughs) I'm not hijacking today. (laughs) We take turns hijacking. We do. We do. No, but it's fascinating. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know much about the real estate, um, but I'm learning more because we are getting more and more people, especially coming to Sales Gravy, who have that kind of background. So, you know, learning a lot more about it, but have we come to the, would you rather question? That yeah, is the question. Uh, right before we get to the, would you rather question, which is how we start to end the show, Beth is, uh, are there some, you know, could you give one, two or three tips to people in real estate right now who are struggling and they don't have the leadership that should be putting these things in place for them? What, right what advice would you give them right now to get past PTSD, to, to be in a better mindset? What are, what are some things people could do? I would say, first of all, guard, um, guard yourself very carefully. You really can't afford the luxury of a negative thought. So just avoid that. And even the, the chatter and the complaining that can happen on, you know, social groups and stuff like that, you got to tune it out. Uh, put your head down and focus on what you need to do. But with that being said, I think that taking care of your own physical and emotional well-being is really critical now more than ever. This business has always required high physical and emotional stamina. And we haven't always been dodging, you know, playing dodgeball the way we are now, where it's just like the hits just keep coming. I think also we're not going to carry on doing business the way that we've always done it. And I think being voracious in your appetite for um, who can I listen to or read or follow that has great, strong messages and 
focusing more on the examples of the successes that have been attained by people despite this. Because look, the reality is, again, in any market, in any conditions, homes are bought and sold. So this idea that the sky is falling does not serve you. What I also hope is that those that get into real estate, the most successful, also tend to be extremely entrepreneurial, think and act like that. Mm -hmm. The majority of the women in my CEO sister circle are also real estate investors who have created a multiple stream of income for themselves from what they sell, from what they own, um, that they rent, and, and then the other stream of income that they get from teams. So what I'm encouraging people to consider as well, and then I'll shut up, is what have we learned as a result of this? Did we white knuckle our way through it, still hoping that it's all going to be better six months from now? Or did we say, as a result of the last two years, here's what I've learned. I don't ever want to feel that way again because I've had all my eggs in this one particular basket. Mm -hmm. And yes, Susanna, there's been a lot of talk about you know, the real estate industry today. However, business is business. The fundamentals and, you know, the foundations and the core is all essentially the same. Mm -hmm. So we just happen to be the industry that I think are, are experiencing perhaps. Yeah. A, a lot of, a, a lot of pushback and a lot of um, having to be on the defensive more than most. And, and Beth is right. This goes, this isn't just about real estate. So if you were to take what Beth just said and you, and you put it in other industry salesperson terms, right? This is also about having a strong pipeline. When she talks about having other revenue streams, um, you could think about what are you doing to keep your pipeline going? You're keeping your pipeline going is not just about, did I close a deal today? Right. Keeping, keeping money coming in is other ways to bring money in. Is it centers of influence? Is it referrals? Is it a mm. longer play with, you know, the buyer you have today that might buy again in three years, right? Those, those, that kind of mindset, looking at every opportunity as either a now opportunity or a future opportunity. I talked to someone this morning, a prospect who, um, it was interesting and he's in another country, but he, he brought, he brought some interesting ideas to me. He's not really trying to be a customer of ours, but he's trying to be a partner of ours. And I didn't expect it, but once we got into the conversation, I'm always looking at how could I leverage this relationship where I can make it profitable for both me, the company and him, right? Like just being in that mindset, if you have your pipeline filling in different ways, you're not going to get to that place of woe is me, the sky is falling. Desperation roller coaster. Desperation roller coaster. Yeah. yeah. Now we can get to, unless Beth wants to comment on that. Nope. I'm ready. Bring on the next thing. Bring it on. No, one thing that actually I, I promise I'll get onto the would you rather question, but you know, I have been quiet for a while, so I'm going to get this one out. <laughs> um, one thing that really, really struck a chord with me um, that, that you were saying, Beth, was about the responsibility for the leadership. And it got me thinking about my clients and the most successful ones. Now, one of my most successful clients who, who runs a huge company um, for education recruitment is always available to take my call as his recruiter. Okay, always available for anyone. And it differs very much from the, the client that might be really busy, too busy to take your call and just running around frantically trying to look busy and probably doesn't notice what's happening to the people. And you see the difference in the retention for the companies, you see the difference in the recruitment. Every time this client recruits for his company, he keeps them. Um, and he says, it, you know, if they don't work out immediately, we will back them um, and do everything we can to make sure that 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 it works. And it it made me realize all the reasons why the company that they, they have thrives in the way it does. So great insight there. Thank you. The real estate industry is very interesting because the the bar for entry is extremely low. I don't mean any disrespect by saying that. And I want to see the look on your faces when I when I make this statement to you. Okay. Would it surprise you to learn 
that in almost every state in the United States, it takes four times longer to become a manicurist than a real estate agent. That that doesn't surprise me. That I, I, I mean, it doesn't surprise me just because I know there's like health things related, and uh, but I, I hear where you're going with this, right? Yeah, twenty dollar manicure, yeah. six and seven figure right, decision. Right. How do you have the responsibility around? Yeah. But but here's my here's my point, as Susanna, when you were speaking, what it made me think of is that for those in leadership within the real estate industry. People come into this very Mm -hmm. often because they see the opportunity for freedom, flexibility, financial rewards, or they love people and they love houses, but they may have very little business acumen Right. Right. and they've only been trained how to pass the real estate exam, not how to really function as a practitioner. So the responsibility Mm -hmm. is even higher. Yeah. If you, if you want to see your people perform, you're going to have to really be all in and be available and model all, all of the things. Yeah, and you could say that about a lot of sales roles, right? They, they're they really good salespeople. It doesn't mean that they needed a formal education. They're really good salespeople. And then they get promoted to leadership. And um, we see this over and over and over again, which is what keeps us in business too, is that they've had no sales leadership training. Mm-hmm. Just because they're great salespeople, doesn't mean that they're great sales leaders, right? So that's where the training piece of it has to come into this. All right. I think Beth and I are done, Susanna, talking. I think you can take over again. (laughs) It is time. (laughs) It's like a little dance, isn't it? It's a little little dance. Um, But we always, if you've listened to these episodes before, you know at the end, I like to do my quirky, would you rather questions. So I guess we have a a choice today of... um, a bit quirky or a bit interesting, which would you look rather choose? Mm. Beth gets to choose. My choices are quirky or interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Let's go with interesting. So Beth, would you rather <laughs> have telekinesis, which means the ability to move things with your thank, mind? Thank you. I needed or, that definition. Thank you. <laughs> or telepathy which means the um ability to read minds oh. so the ability to move mm. things with your mind so think matilda um or the ability to read minds um well if you talk to my clients they will tell you that they think that i do read their mm-hmm. mind um <laughs> highly intuitive highly empathic so i think i would go with telekinesis because I know I don't have any of that, but I do have a little of the other. Very interesting. You developed the skill yourself without being needed to be given it. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) Um, And Gina, you get to answer too. Same exact answer. Same exact answer. I'm highly intuitive and an empath. Mm -hmm. And I hear it all the time that it appears I can read mine. So that is, that is definitely a skill set of mine. So if I could move things, um, I could hit some people what in the head. I, I could hit some people in the head that need to be hit in the head and they would never know it's me. I would I would maybe slam a few doors. <laughs> wow. Very aggressive ladies we have here. <laughs> so I knew we would love Beth. Uh, I we really do. And I, if anyone wants to know my answer, I'm gonna give it anyway. Yeah, so yeah, what about you? Okay. <laughs> oh, Susanna, what about you? Oh, sorry, Susanna. So, nobody puts baby in the corner. Go on, Susanna. What my do you answer choose? Is, <laughs> nobody puts baby in the corner. <laughs> I feel like that's the second time you said that to me. Um, but anyway, um, I would probably say not yet is my ability to close hundred percent of my deals. Um, but if I had complete telepathy then I would. So I would improve those skills. To I read knew people. you would choose that. Because mm. you, know, until- you know, you know how I knew? Go on. Because I could read minds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I see what oh, you did dear. there. <laughs> She's inside my head. <laughs> oh, Beth, this has been so great having you on the show. Thanks for uh, entertaining uh, my <laughs> suggestion and request for you to come on the show. I knew, I knew I liked you from the second I started looking um, at your website. If people want to connect with you and learn more about you and maybe get into the CEO uh, sister circle, um, 
uh, what's the best way to connect to you? Probably the best way to connect is just to shoot me an email to uh, beth at agentactivator.com or you can visit my website at agentactivator.com. Awesome. Thank you again so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Totally my pleasure. Thank you so much. And Warners, thanks for listening to this episode of The Women Your Mother Warns You About, sponsored by Sales Gravy and Jeb Blunt. For more information about Sales Gravy, go to salesgravy.com, but really go to salesgravy.university where we have all kinds of resources and courses that are going to up-level you in sales. For more information about the show, go to womenyourmotherwarnsyouabout.com and you can also find all of our social media platforms there. And we are out of here, Warners. Bye, Beth. Bye, Susanna. Bye, Warners. Bye. Bye. Now we got to be professional. It's all your fault.